So um, as Liz and Jenny said, um, my name is Megan Richardson. I'm a research associate at Research for Better Schools, and we're the external evaluator for, for Mars First in the World Grant. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about Research for Better Schools, we're a nonprofit education and research, uh, education research and evaluation organization located in Philadelphia. And our role in this grant is to assist Bryn Mawr in designing an evaluation that will meet the criteria laid out by the Department of Education. Um, so I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about the evaluation and our data collection plans um, and to answer your questions you may have. So just to give you an idea of um, what I'm going to be talking about this morning, first I'll talk about the Department of Education's requirements for the evaluation of the uh, FIPWA grant. Um, then I'll talk about the data we're going to be asking you to collect. And then we'll talk briefly about the draft of the pre post test and survey, and then I'll address any questions you might have at the end. So, um, is anyone familiar with the What Works Clearinghouse? If you raise your hand. No? Okay. Um, so, the What Works Clearinghouse um, was developed by the Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. And basically, it um, has these standards that help identify uh, studies of that are credible and have that use moderate evidence of effectiveness um, to look at the effectiveness of education interventions. And so they're pretty rigorous standards. And those are the standards that the Department of Education want us to follow in evaluating the First in the World grant. And so specifically, there are four criteria that they want us to have in, these, in this evaluation. And these few, next few slides are directly from the Department of Education. Um, we went to a meeting with them in March down in DC and they shared these with us. Um, so those criteria are that we have to have at least two distinct groups in our evaluation, that we have to establish baseline equivalence between those groups, there could be no confounding factors in our study, and that our study has to have appropriate outcomes. And I'm going to cover each of these four criteria in a little bit more detail. So first is that we have to have two distinct groups. So we're going to have an intervention group, and that is going to be the group of students who participate in the blended just-in-time math fundamentals project. And then we're going to be having a comparison group of those of the students who do not, do not participate in that. And to further clarify, these with, for the two groups, um, you cannot use one group and do a pre-test and post-test. That does not count. It can't just be one group, pre-test, post-test. Um, and we also aren't allowed, as Jenny mentioned earlier, to use a historical cohort to meet what works clearinghouse standards. That doesn't mean we can't use it in the evaluation at all. It just means that for our reporting to the Department of Ed, that can't be our comparison group. Um, also, keeping in mind for the distinct groups, we have to have a clear definition of the intervention. So we have to clearly define what is the blended uh, just-in-time math fundamentals project that you're implementing in each of your institutions. What is that? And what is the eligibility criteria for the students? So who are these marginally math prepared students? So those both have to be clearly defined. And then we have to either create our groups using um, creating them randomly or non-random. So a random would be a random control trial. A non-random would be a quasi-experimental design. Currently, we're planning for a quasi-experimental design just because we know the difficulties that come with trying to do a random control trial in higher education. Um, so it'll be a convenient sample, we use some matching, and it'll be retrospective. Because we are doing a quasi-experimental design, we have to establish baseline equivalence between the two groups to ensure that differences that we're seeing um, aren't related to differences between the two groups prior to the intervention. And so uh, the What Works Clearinghouse has established for post-secondary studies, there are certain areas in which we have to do baseline equivalence. And those areas are, we have to establish baseline equivalence on socioeconomic status. And typically the measure of socioeconomic status that's used for the students is Pell Grant eligibility. And then the other area for which we have to establish baseline equivalence is some kind of academic achievement measure. Um, typically, it's suggested that you use SAT or ACT scores, and in this case, it would make most sense to use the math SAT, ACT, but I, I believe a lot of your institutions are test optional, if that's kind of correct. Yeah, I'm seeing some nods. Um, so that is potentially a little problematic, and so we're also going to be requesting um, high school GPAs. We know that's not the best measure, but um, if that's what we have to use, it's, it's the next best thing. Um, I'm sorry? You don't have either SAT. Many schools don't provide the ranking information. <coughs> GPA. Yeah. But the GPA as calculated on a 4.0 or 5.0 and. Yeah, 4.0 or 
It, it, that's problematic, I know, but um, I think we'll get to that point when, when we're there. It, just, just so I'm clear, when we're looking for this baseline equivalence, that's within a single institution. Um, ultimately, we're going to be aggregating all of them. So hopefully, if there's a, a intervention in Paris group at all schools, then it'll still come out with being baseline equivalent. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and then finally, because we are giving out a pre-test, post-test, we'll also be having, having to establish um, baseline equivalence on, on that as well. Um, so there's three things we'll have to do based on equivalence for. And then um, what works clearinghouse looks at your difference. You have to calculate the based on equivalence and see what the difference size of the difference is. And so if it's between 0 and 0 0.05, that's considered uh, based on equivalent. If it's between 0 0.05 and 0 0.25, then you have to use some um, statistical adjustment to make them based on equivalent. And if the difference is greater than 0 0.25, then they're not considered uh, equivalent at baseline. And then we'll make, we might have to do some matching of some sorts to make them equivalent based. I have a weird question, maybe you answered it, but in Basel, let's say we have two sections and one, one section is going to have it in one section in the right. first semester of physics. Okay. Let's say the other professor wants to do it in the second semester of physics. Do we then have to control who came through the blended learning? Is that an additional amount, even in factor of who came through the blended I, learning? I think, I think that is something we're going to have to consider because it's kind of a building uh, more of a dosage right. if they've already had it. So, yeah, that is also <laughs> something. I would assume if it is two sections of the same course taught by the same instructor is what's necessary. You can't have one section doing it with Professor A and the other section that's not doing it with Professor B. Well, because we're doing it across so many schools, that's okay. That is okay. Yes. Because it's across so many schools, um, so that it's not that, that difference won't be attributable to the professor anymore once there's so many schools involved. And I'm sorry, a lot of this information might be common sense for some people. I, I, don't, I don't mean to offend you if that's the case. This is not comprehensive. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and this this part can get a little confusing. I know the people they said that to us, um, and I know this this part can. So um, the third criteria is that we can't have any confounding factors in our evaluation. So a compound is basically um, a component that's completely aligned to one study condition. So if there's something that's only happening to the treatment group, aside from the intervention, um, or only happening in the comparison group, that can be a compound. It's also something that makes it impossible to attribute the impact solely to the intervention. And so um, they lay out what some of those common compounds are. And as we mentioned earlier, having a single unit, so say if just Bryn Mawr was in the intervention and then Vassar was in the comparison, that's a compound because you don't know what differences are actually related to the institutions rather than the intervention. Um, then, um, as we mentioned a little earlier, um, if the intervention is bundled with other services not being studied, so that goes to um, somebody's point earlier about other interventions, and so we have to be mindful of what those are. When you say bundled, mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our other services are called like optional mm -hmm. and they're not required. So we'll say for instance, a student decided to use SI in addition to being in the section, but they're not required right. to do it, we're not. So I think we're going to have to we're going to have to figure out some way to ask the students um, what additional services they may okay. have gone yeah, gone to, you know, ask them, you know, did you go to tutoring this semester for math, things like that. So we can kind of account for that. And then the final um, compound is um, treatment and comparison groups occurring at different times. So this is where they get that um, we're not allowed to use historical uh, cohorts um, because they attribute it to um, differences be related to time rather than the intervention. Um, so, so we can do that. We, we, right, it just doesn't. Because I think right. it makes sense. We just have to do something besides that to satisfy these guys. Right, that, exactly. It's, it just doesn't meet what works clearinghouse standards. Um, personally, so still good. Yeah, I personally don't have a problem with it, um, but that's their standards. Um, Another thing that we should say in preface to this, too, all of this, is that um, even though they were saying research, research, we want really good research to come out of this, they do recognize that we're all trying to deal with very complex um, issues, and so therefore, of course, our interventions are very complex and multi-tiered and, and you're, you know, and, draw on other things that are outside of the study and so yes it's messy and they get that. So. Right. They, they, this is just telling us what we need, ideally need to strive for. Right. And we can only do some, we can do the best we can. Right. So if say calculus two different instructors are teaching in different ways, one is primarily lecture and I 
I in recent years have been doing focal service, other sort of group work sort of thing. Is that an issue? We've got a control group doing yeah. lecture style yeah. and having very different things. Yeah. Doing my style. Right. Um, again, I think it should be okay given that, again, it's so many universities yeah. involved, and so that hopefully that won't count for too much. Yeah. But one thing we'll want to do is once you guys have figured out, you know, exactly which classes this is going to go into and which instructors will be teaching and stuff like that, is we'll want to sit down and say sort of, you know, a little interview. How do you conduct this course? What is it like? You know, just to have that data so that right. if we notice your class is like way off the charts or something, we can say, hey, if you do this in this way, it appears to be different than if you just do it in any old way. And then our fourth uh, criteria is that we have to have out appropriate outcomes. Um, they are going to be used to determine the impact of our intervention. And so appropriate outcomes or eligible outcomes are those that have face validity. They measure what they're supposed to measure. They're reliable. They measure things consistently. They're not over aligned with the intervention. I think a good example of that would be, say, yesterday when we were looking at the modules. Um, we couldn't use one of the problems that was in a module in our assessment because the treatment group has had exposure to that. That's kind of unfair to the comparison group. Um, and then it needs to be, the outcomes need to be collected in a similar manner across groups. So we couldn't use, say, an assessment with our treatment group, but then the comparison group just um, do focus groups and somehow try to compare those. Can I, can you go back to So this persistence through spring of 2016, what does that mean? So, they, so the, those, the things up there are examples that the uh, Department of Education were giving. They're not specific to our project. So for example, if you were, um, uh, Yes. So if you were if you were looking for persistence, this is the kinds of things that you would need to be thinking about to make sure that you're measuring it correctly. If that makes sense. We're not looking. At persistence, persistence isn't one yeah. of our outcomes. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I should have <laughs> kind of explain that. Because, yeah, throughout the presentation, there's like some examples, and some of them pertain to us a little bit more than others. But that's because these slides are from the Department of Ed. Yeah. So this is that's not specifically one of our outcomes. I'm going to actually just about to get to what our outcomes are, and I'll try to talk about that a little more. <clears throat> Okay, and then there's a few just last criteria from what we're declaring has. We just need to be mindful of um, making sure we have minimal attrition or loss of participants from the data collection, and then sufficient enough sample size, thankfully, because all of you are involved. That hopefully will not be an issue. We'll have lots of people, hopefully, participating <coughs> um, to ensure our, our findings aren't due to chance. Um, so that really kind of covers what the Department of Education is expecting from us. So what does that really mean for you guys? Um, it means that we're going to need some information from you in order to plan our evaluation and then to carry it out. So as Jenny was just showing the um, spreadsheet, that, that quote unquote homework, um, that is to help us, as we were saying, for the evaluation planning. So if you've not had the chance to fill that out, we really would appreciate it. It helps us to determine what makes the most sense for us going forward. Um, and then this information is more related to data we're going to need for um, actually looking at the outcomes of the evaluation. So um, before we ask any data of, for any data from your institution, we're going to go through institutional review board process and get approval from the institutions um, for the data request as well as for the pre and post test. Um, so you just you're aware of that. Um, How many of you guys just out of curiosity have have had experience with working with your IR, um, IRPs? <laughs> okay. So for you guys, we're going to try and, if at all possible, make this um, exempt but if not exempt, then certainly expedited. So we, we anticipate it not requiring a full IRB review. That helps. Will, will we have to go through IRB at each school? That will be depending on your IRB. Um, our IRB would insist that we did if it was you guys doing this. So basically, what usually happens is Bryn Mawr will do it first, and then we'll give you our materials and sort of say our IRB, you know, letter from our IRB chair saying we've blessed this, <laughs> and that usually makes it a lot easier for you guys. Okay. All right. So um, on the blue sheet you have, um, it's basically the same information as um, on this slide. So even though you're not starting the intervention this coming fall, we're going to ask you to um, start piloting the data collection this fall, just so we can work out any kinks. Um, and also possibly do the historical comparison as well. Um, so information we're going to be asking for, we're going to be asking it for every student enrolled in the targeted gateway courses, so starting this fall. So every student, um, I think we decided that every student means everybody who's still enrolled after drop ad. Because if they drop before that, then we don't really, we don't really care about them anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> they're um, shopping. Yeah, they're shopping, basically. And so 
And the things we're going to be asking for is the student's name, their highest SAT math or ACT math score, and their high school GPA. Again, that's so we can establish baseline equivalence, um, Pell Grant eligibility also for uh, baseline equivalence. Uh, Pell Grant eligibility also is um, of interest because we're going to be looking at several subgroups of the, of the study population. And those subgroups um, are, in particular, um, low-income students, first-generation college students, underrepresented minorities, and females. And so those next couple of categories, that is why we're asking for that information as well. Yes. How many, what do you mean by gender? Sorry, Anna Mills. Um, um, like yes. male, female, other um, things also? Well, haven't gotten to that point to think about that yet. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's a good thing to be mindful of. Um, haven't quite thought about that yeah. in that much detail yet. Mm -hmm. uh, for international students, do you have a plan regarding things like Pell eligibility? I did not. Um, this is why so I, I, I defer. I defer to you. Some of us have really high percentages okay. of international. Yeah, right. I, I, I would defer to you guys. I want to say more. the Department of Ed really isn't concerned about them. <laughs> so, yeah, I I <laughs> you know so, in some ways. Um, Probably we're looking at Americans, um, and so we will collect data on all of your international uh, students and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. But probably what we'll be focusing yeah. on is the Americans within yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Sure. But then, of course, how do you define an American and right. who's foreign and yeah. the pieces? Well, yeah. 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 How are we to find the first generation in this program? That's again something I think as a group we need to talk about. Um, I don't have expertise in defining that, so um, I would defer to you guys on that as well. And I suspect we don't all have the same definition on our campuses. Right. So we need to collect those definitions and carry them forward. Right. And that's one of the reasons we need to work with your IR people, and actually IR, IR, IR people, IR people, sorry, <laughs> and, and, and agree on the, on the definition. The, right, because I would suspect even the definitions for each one of these things. Right, even yeah. race ethnicity might be different across yeah. campuses. Yeah. I don't have. But they don't expect yeah. you to change your. Shouldn't make. Okay. Just yeah. need to learn that. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. some of this data, if you guys are familiar with, you know, iPads, we're all collecting data that we report to the government. So yes, but who, what you include under underrepresented minority varies across campuses. So we want to be specific about that. And where there isn't a governmental sort of, here's how we do it, um, it will be helpful to find out how you guys are already collecting data on first uh, generation, for example, um, because you, you know, it's really hard for us to say, okay, this is the definition and you go collect your data differently, right? So what we might have to do is sort of just have a sense of how everybody's collecting it and then describe that in our, you know, Can we put yeah. together a spreadsheet like we did for the courses? Absolutely. Yes. 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 And that might be interesting for you, IRB groups. Maybe it's worth saying this is why we asked you to have a member from your campus um, Office of Institutional Research. We don't expect faculty to sort this all out. We want a member from your campus who's an expert of how it's done to be part of your team. Yeah. So they can do this piece with us. Well, some of this I know on our campus, um, it's collected with first generation white students. Self-identification. That is the case in many, many different things. So that might be <laughs> From a research perspective, it's not good, but the Department of Ed knows this because, right, I mean, same thing with race. So, so this is what we have, right? Yeah. You know, Liz, to your point, at least on our campus, all of this does not just reside in our IR office. It's three different offices. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I, when I need to get these data, I have to go to three different offices. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like the same thing. Okay. 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 As you were talking about students who count are those at the, at the drop date, and you had asked about dates on there, but we have two different dates. One is a drop add date, and one is a final date at which you could drop a course without it incurring a grade. Right. And those are very different times. So yes. I assume you want the former and not the latter. Right. So we also have a, um, you can have a fifth course sort of riding on your schedule for a little bit longer than the drop add date and drop that course. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's but that was the purpose of that question on your on exactly. Your and you, you kind definitely of float want to these ideas, yeah, and see sort of 
which one makes most sense, right? I mean, in some ways with Braemar, I feel like, well, we should go with the later date because what if the fifth course is your STEM course, you know, and you sort of say, I want to, yeah. But probably most, either registrar or IR office on each individual campus has a date at which they say, okay, now it's official. Yes, right. so they will have a census date, date, and that's a good date for you. Yeah, they have a date by which they, uh, Lindsay is here, yeah. yeah. It's called the census date. Yeah, yeah. yeah. ours is the October 1st. Yeah, so that might be the date to use instead of the drop date. Yeah, you guys are getting a picture of the, the dirty, uh, <laughs> the dirty institutional research uh, world. No, it's all, of course, in perfect view. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all doing it. All right. So then, some other data we're going to need is um, the semester and year end of college, um, so we know who the population of students are, as well as um, when we can expect to ask for other outcome data related to, you know, if they're freshmen, then we'll know. Okay, in four years, when we'll ask about did they graduate. Um, we'll want to know if they're a graduate of a remedial math program, if such programs exist at your institution. <laughs> uh, we'll want to know if they're marginally math prepared. I believe the definition of that is still to be determined by each institution, I think. Um, and actually, we have since been talking about maybe it makes sense to not ask that and just sort of figure that out from the data. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So but th that one's still to be determined. Um, and then we'll start asking about some of our short-term outcomes. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. If they came in with their major already declared, we'll want to know that. Um, and, and then we start getting into some of our short-term outcomes. Their final grade in the targeted gateway course, and then the results on the um, this pre and post test is what we'll be asking for this fall. So then we're going to need some student data, again, um, starting spring of 20, uh, I'm sorry, fall of 2016 and later when, once you actually start implementing the program at your school. And so we'll need to know for each student whether or not they were in the intervention or comparison group. Uh, for intervention students, we'll want to know how many modules they completed, how many coaching sessions, or whatever your in-person component is, how many, how many sessions of that they uh, attended. And then we'll, for our like intermediate term outcomes, we'll need to know uh, the semester and year of their graduation, their major at graduation, and then their major, their GPA and their major at graduation. But that's kind of the period of the spring. Yeah. Yeah, they right. won't be graduating outside the screen. Yeah. <laughs> I believe there's supposed to be agreement that you'll still collect this even though. Yes, there is actually a clause in the um, the, uh, the thing that says we're all committed to doing this through 2020. Um, I have found that that is hard sometimes and that everybody loses interest, including our grantors. So you know, <laughs> I'm just uh, I think be interesting to find out what the long-term outcomes and if we can keep collecting data that is fabulous but so I'm just supposed to right. present it <laughs> <laughs> and then there's going to be some institutional oh I'm sorry sorry can I just make one suggestion that, um, a thought instead of only using names to identify students if we could add in an, an ID a civil ID number yes. something sure. like that just yes. because you need for collecting data over time and Right. It's going to be a lot easier to merge by ID than by name. Yeah, if, if, if every institution has their own student ID number, that I think that'd be great as well. That would be better. Another question, and this gets into the uh, IRB issues, is how comfortable everyone is, um, or each college is, with sharing data that includes a student's name with us. You guys might find your IR um, or equivalent wants to do the sort of collecting with a unique number and just giving us the number and not the name. They might not even want to give us the number. They might want to give us just totally anonymized data, in which case they would have to be the ones matching over time. Right, right. right. So that's, that's just a concern, sense. basically, is that we need to be able to match different data to these students over right. number we of years. We need to do it or you guys need yeah. to do it, but it needs to happen. So, so actually, it occurs to me, we have students, uh, particularly international students, where we do not know their gender. So. In addition guess, to, right. they identify a gender that's not the standard. We need a, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, asking. I think in some cases they're just going to be missing information, and that just is what it is. And it's interesting, so that we're, I guess for the purposes of this study, women in STEM are considered an underrepresented group, right? So what we really want to know is, are they a woman? Or um, now, does that mean, do they self-identify as a woman? You know, do they... I don't care in some ways, right? <laughs> um, so, 
it's not really, we don't really want to know their gender so much as whether or not they fall into the underrepresented category of women. That makes sense. Not cis male is really what you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Both gender, yeah. Um, so then some of the long-term outcomes that the grant had is that um, at an institutional level there would be some change in the number of percentages of various groups declaring a STEM major and completing a STEM major, and so that's what we're going to be asking for. Um, we have to establish what the baseline years are there to be determined, and that's the green sheet, I'm sorry. Um, and so once we identify what those baseline years, we'll start asking you for that information, and that's also why we asked you to identify a peer institution, because Fingers crossed, we're going to ask them to be very nice and share with us this institutional level data on their schools as well and use them as a comparison group, um, maybe possibly incentivizing them by um, sharing modules with them in the future. And also, some of this is our that we can use. Um, Just a comment about peer schools. I, I don't think Brunel is unusual in that we have a group of peer mm -hmm. schools that, frankly, is skewed toward the high end mm -hmm. rather than really peers because there's right. a certain aspirational element. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm aware. <laughs> that, right, that, that can skew your comparison. Yeah, right, right. So I'm, I'm going to have to like mine the uh, uh, suggested peer schools and kind of, yeah, they figure that out. Also, we are, uh, in many cases, certainly Smith, Vassar, you know, we're, we're each other's peers, too. Which yeah. Are, so that's, yeah. yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's not the problem. Each other. Okay, and then, um, oh, do you have the copies of I do. So I only made 13 copies of these because they're long. <laughs> One for each campus. Okay. Can share, but they're only <laughs> they're only draft. And what you'll see oh, is, so um, I'll just do one round for now. Look at this. Pass it back. Um, they are a stand. Well, I'll let you describe what they are. Yes. So. Um, Thinking back to what I was saying about the What Works Clearinghouse Standards for Appropriate Outcomes, uh, they really push the need to use validated instruments, um, and so that's a big constraint on what we can use. Um, and so, for those of you who are not researchers, validated instrument means um, a standardized test that's recognized as actually measuring what people think it measuring. Yes. Yeah, you have to share. Okay, so um, the, the purpose of the pre and post tests is to help us, some of, help us measure some of our short-term outcomes. And those outcomes were that we're expecting to see an increase in students' mathematics skills and changes in their math attitudes, as well as possibly their plans for their majors. Um, and so that's what the purpose of this pre and post survey and test are. So um, we started by looking for validated instruments to measure mathematics skills, and um, it's just in drafts. It's, uh, but we are possibly looking into using the collegiate assessment of, uh, I should say academic proficiency, sorry. Um, and it was created by the ACT. It's 35 questions long and about 40 minutes. I measure skills in pre-algebra, elementary algebra, intermediate algebra, coordinate geometry, college algebra, and trigonometry. And so I had looked at that list of modules that um, was provided yesterday and tried to see if a lot of those topics would be covered in this test. And it's not a perfect match, but a lot of those topics are covered in this test. Yes. Um, what about uh, students with documented uh, learning um, issues who get to say like five and a half to the whole time? Is that going to be taken into consideration? Here? We hadn't thought about that yet. Um, I guess I can get back to you when we have some more time to think about that. That's a good question. Um, and then next, we wanted to look for a validated instrument that would measure um, things related to math attitudes. And so there's the attitudes towards mathematics inventory, and this is the shortened form. And it's 15 questions, which take less than 10 minutes, and it measures math attitudes and enjoyment of math, self-confidence in math, and perceived value of mathematics. Should you give that before the test? I have very my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to that suggestion. I debated it before I made it. I think it's going to be a pre-post. <laughs> 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 yes, so that's definitely a consideration we could change up the order. I'm, I'm fine with that. Yes. Now how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> now that yeah, you, now you took that awful test, and now you realize you don't know anything. Maybe they need, they need an affirmation at the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, good some kind of weird stereotypes where we're like, I feel bad about math, and now I'm going to take a math test. Right. I'm going to do worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Lots so, of data. Yeah. It's it's too 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 Both things are bad. Yeah. Um, and then finally, there's just two questions at the end that were created by RBS Research Better Schools, 
that just ask about students' interest in a STEM major, as well as asking them about the role that mathematics will play in the selection of a major. Um, so again, this is in a draft form. Yes. I just, when you have the STEM fields, there's a lot of students, at least at our institution, that think they're going to major in pre-health, even though that is not a major at our institution. Especially <laughs> when they're starting. They don't know that they're going to have to choose biology or chemistry. Uh, right. And so I'm wondering if there's any thoughts to play pre-health. Or health related, right? Health fields, yeah. Um, I just a lot, sometimes that's included in a STEM discipline, and sometimes it's not. Yeah, I just used the definition that was in the grant proposal. That's, that's what's currently no, that's on there. something to, t to talk about, yeah. and maybe what to, we should find out is if the Department of Ed mm -hmm. is defining STEM, we should probably use their definition. I know, I know NSF right. has definitions, I'm not sure about NSF that. NSF includes, includes or excludes psychology? That's the grant in proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Includes yeah. psychology, yeah. yeah, so that's a weird one. But. Yeah. Now, now this pretest, you're at Bryn Mawr this coming year going to be pre-testing this pretest, right? <laughs> Possibly. If we if this is the one we just said to use, we just said draft. Because this is this is definitely not necessarily one you're planning to use. I, I, a quick look at this suggests that uh, this group that we're specifically targeting and with the particular needs that we mm -hmm. have in our courses mm -hmm. would maybe get through 10 questions in 40 minutes, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think they would be completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think this would scare off a lot of my faculty. I'm not sure I could finish this test in 40 minutes. <laughs> well, and one of the things we need to think about is, too, um, what is reasonable to ask in terms of a course, like a 50-minute course session, right? And so definitely we want to, you know, if it doesn't make any sense if it's too long or if it's too hard or if it's whatever. We need to find something that's more in tune with what we need. But, but it's a great starting point. So, so so I could suggest maybe that we actually do all get a paper copy of this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we circle the questions that we felt would be relevant. Mm -hmm. That's good. And then you could come up with a consensus of that that's a subset of this. Okay. Would it make sense for me? I can go and make paper copies now if, if that makes sense. If you guys want to do it, hand it back. And also, are the repeat questions the same type of material? You know, could we, you could also want to categorize and say what topics are being questioned. You don't want to right. duplicate that. Right. Which hopefully, that's done, but I'm not sure. So, I don't think everybody heard what the proposal is. What are you guys discussing doing? Well, we were talking about going to. Um, uh, I could run off some more copies, and these guys could go through and kind of vet questionable things and, and uh, circle questions that are useful. Lindsay? I'm sorry, I think, could we put it in a Google Doc and then yeah. you can yes. it amongst your faculty, too, and Now, now there's maybe what's really important to be clear here, if we, it's, if that we've got our own objectives for the success of the, the intervention in our students, and we've got this task to use an instrument that yeah. That's what I was going to say. Then. That's so the problem. The, the we purpose into. of this pre and post test is quite narrowly defined for Megan. That's <laughs> <laughs> not my requirements. It's the yeah. In some ways, in some ways, you're raising a really good point. What's the purpose, and is it an undue kind of burden on faculty and students to take it? But it's um, we may want to separate out these two needs right. and handle them differently. And so I don't we're, think we can change this exam if we uh, wanted to serve. Yeah. We would have to find another exam okay. shorter, so, easier. Exam. <laughs> I, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, this is, yes. this is the best I could find. Now, if, if somebody else finds something better, I can more all over to it. And we've given you is, is the validated instrument, right? And it's it's we have to say the shortest that we found. So right, right. Exactly. So there's other things like, for example, you could reorder the questions. So the no. first N. Yeah, no, no, no. 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 It's like this is never reordered the SAT. Yeah. We don't have that problem. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So we also we need to get yeah we need to get permission from ACT to administer it. So from the math side, a suggestion: the Math Mathematics Association of America. I know in the late nineties had a handwritten test similar to this that was only twenty questions, and it was interesting because some of it just tested pre-algebra or sorry pre-calculus, and then some of it tested trig, and it was kind of broken into two sections. It was much more condensed, and we've actually used that as a, a pre-testing tool in medicine to kind of you know it was a sorting hat, so to speak. Uh, they since moved that online, um, so you got to jump through some hoops. I think they use Maple now. If anybody in the math world, help 
back me up on this. The, the right. MAA's test, right. mass placement test. Placement test. But anyway, that's a, that's a nationally, okay. that's, yeah. our, that's our organization has been vetted and tested yeah. statistically. Yeah. Yada yada. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Make it. Right. And one quick thing: what if you have an honorary faculty member who won't do it? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who all would you envision doing this? Because as some of our things are controlled, so you're saying everybody at our institution in every section of every introductory yep. physics and math and chemistry course is going to take this. And that's not going to fly. Right. Right. And and I gave it two class times: one at the beginning and one at the end. And yeah, and does I, it have to happen yes. in the class time or not? I would argue it doesn't have to. I mean, we well, have I to. I still have ordinary faculty here. Yeah. Like, you know, oh yeah. yeah. It can yeah. come an assignment that the students have to complete. We in their should. Own we time. should talk about the uh, ways in which we can make this um, possible um, to collect this data um, with this instrument on our campuses. There's no assumptions about it having to be in a class, and there's no assumptions that students that are taking multiple classes would take it multiple times. Oh yeah, just students. We have to right. work out an implementation scheme. Is, is there any money in the budget? We have to wrap this up, but we'll move the group down to Dalton 